Hello everyone, welcome back. Today I'll be sharing a game between Robert James Fisher and Mark Taimanov. And this game was the fourth game of the of their 1971 six game candidates match, which Fisher beat Taimanov in all six games. So that's still the world records from today. And this game is an extremely famous game. It's the fourth game of the series, and I'm going to take you through it. So Fisher starts off with e4, c5, knight c3, knight c6, d4, c takes d4, knight takes d4, queen c7. And here Fisher plays knight c3, which transposes back into the main line. However, here Fisher could take advantage of Black's odd queen c7 move and play something like c4, or Black can also play something like bishop e3 which are both extremely good moves. Here, however, after queen c7, here Fisher plays knight c3, and here black plays e6, and this transposes back to the Taimana variation of the Sicilian. And in case you guys haven't figured it out, this opening is named after Mark Taimana, which is playing black against Fisher right now. And here Fisher plays an extremely solid line against the Taimana. Fisher plays g3. And the whole point of g3 is to get a solid position and white wants to castle short in this line. Here black plays a6, black, white plays bishop g2, black plays knight f6, white plays castles, and here black decides to trade knights, which is not that good of a move. A better move would be instead here to play h5, which means that black wants to play something like bishop d6, bring that in, and also threaten g3 pawn as much as he can. So here, after this, after castles, black takes instead, and here white takes with the queen. And here, after bishop c5, white plays an extremely strong move, which gives white the advantage. So take your time and hope that you spot it. Okay, I hope you did. Right now, white's queen doesn't have a good square to retreat to. However, white doesn't need to retreat his queen. White has an extremely strong move, bishop f4. And the whole point of this move is that white attacks black's queen while black attacks white's. And now, black, white has developed an extra piece with a tempo. So here, black has a choice. Black wants to trade queens, which white can take the queen back. And this position should be better for white because of all these weak dark squares. So instead, Taimanov declines this trade and plays d6, but here white comes back with queen d2. And normally, with the bishop on c1, queen d2 would be the worst move ever because the bishop would be here getting blocked in. But now white has spent a tempo on bishop f4, which allows white to develop his pieces quicker. And here Taimanov plays h6, which is a subtle move, but an also extremely good one. So here now black will play rook a d1 and now black has to respond with e5 in order not to lose the d6 pawn and here white plays bishop e3 and now instead of reacting to any of the bishops here black decides to play bishop g4 which practically forces white to take the bishop first and after black takes with the pawn now white is able to play f3 and after bishop b6 now white responds with f4 and now white is trying to break up the center as quick as possible and actually here black had an alternative but if black takes with the queen white can take back with the pawn and queen here and black would lose the pawn but as you will see the pawn on c5 will become a big problem in the future so after f4 black has to play rook d8 and after rook d8 now white plays now after rook d8 white will play an extremely strong move but before white plays black plays rook d8 black should have castled and after castles white should play f5 and after f5 black should because f5 is the main challenge of this position but now black has rook d8 and after queen e3 bishop c8 and now Black should be completely fine here, and this isn't a big problem anymore. However, in this position, after f4 and rook d8, here white 
is able to play knight d5, which is an extremely strong move because it appears as though the c5 square is a weak square, but now black has many moves that he can try, and now, but all of them aren't as good. So here, black decides to take with the bishop. O other moves are just aren't as good as taking with the bishop, and after taking, here, black decides to play e4. And after e4, what did white play in this position? Take your time, and I hope you spot it, because now you're going to try to save Fisher's d5 pawn, which is under threat. You found it? If you did, the congratulations, the move was rook f1. Now, this move looks extremely strange at first, and even the computer doesn't like it. But as you will see in the future, this move is extremely strong. Because now black has to take on d5, and now white is able to respond with rook takes e4 check. And the whole point here is that now black has a few moves to decide on. If black plays king f8 here, white is able to play rook e8 check. And this move is extremely powerful, because now after black needs to take, white plays bishop takes d5, and now black, although can look like he wants to castle, black castling right now is an illegal move because black's king has moved already which means that now white is completely winning so this position black is forced to play king d8 and now white plays queen e2 the reason why white played queen e2 is because white wants to trade off this amazing work on d5 and now black's king will be vulnerable however playing the queen to e2 was not the best move after king d8 white should have played queen e1 and the reason behind this is now this forces black to take white's rook because now something like queen c6 can be reacted by the move rook e2. Now normally the e2 square wasn't even there, but now rook e2, now the bishop is coming back and the rook is able to defend the bishop in case of any emergency. After queen e2, white doesn't have all this freedom. But anyway, after queen e2, black still took the rook, so both lines will have transposed. And now white would play queen takes d1. And after queen d7, here white plays queen takes d7 because if white doesn't trade, white won't have an advantage. And after king takes d7, white here plays rook e5. So here we enter a Fisher endgame. And in case no one knows about this, Fisher endgames are rook and bishop versus rook and knight. And the reason why they're called bishop endgames, it, Fisher endgames I mean, it's because that Robert James Fisher was an expert at playing these. And here, black already makes a mistake, right after. Here, black plays b6. And the reason why b6 is bad is now the bishop has a lot more room. If if black didn't play b6, black should have played king d6. Now, bishop takes b7 is not a good move here. Here's after rook b8, bishop a6, rook takes a2, and now black is getting his pawns back. And the less pawns, the better it is for black. So after king d6, White should play something like b4, preparing to trade after, but here black plays b6. And the main reason is because white is committing his pawn and is going to need to trade pawns. And this position, although white is still better after bishop f1, this position isn't as good anymore. So after rook e5, black plays the dubious move b6, and now white is able to play bishop f1. This practically forces a5. And now black plays bishop c4, attacking f7. And now, as you can see, all these pawns are weak. The b5 square is weak, and white has a solid and irrefutable advantage. Here, black plays rook f8. And after rook f8, white starts bringing his king. And all of this is quite simple. Until here, black has to play knight d7 and disrupt the rook on e5. And here, Fisher has to come back. And here, Taimala plays knight b8 which is an extremely good defense because now the knight is going to come to c6 and d4. However, this is going to be a long and grueling defense as white's advantage is long term and the advantage won't just fall out easily. So here white checks and after king c7, white plays c3. So after black plays knight c6, white protects both of these important squares. Nevertheless, black still plays knight c6 and after rook e3, king d6, white finally decides to play a4, securing the b5 square. Here, black plays knight e7, and after h3, now white is trying to play g4. And after knight c6, a knight c8 was a better move because now the knight wanted to come to d6 right, af 
right after. But after knight c6, now white started to play h4. And now white is aiming to somehow break open the king side by pushing his g-pawn up. And here, now black plays h5. And this move guards against this square. But now the h-pawn will become a weakness as white is a light-squared bishop. And now white has to play rook d3. And then now white just maneuvers. And here white plays rook d5. Now black is forced to play f5. Because if black, black plays g6 instead, white is able to play f5 himself. And here, it's not that good of a position, but sooner or later, something bad will happen. And sometimes here, black, black can just play bishop b5. f5 wasn't the best move. It's some easy motif that you can get messed up on. So yeah, I should watch out later too. But as you can see, after g6, bishop b5, now if black plays the exact same thing, now there's rook d7. And this is just a disaster. So anyway, back to the main game. After f5, white now can play rook d2, and now rook f6 is played. And sooner or later, bishop king d7, and then now white just needs to wait. And now black plays g6, and now bishop b5. And after d bishop b5, the game was adjourned. And this means that the game went on for too long and now it's way too late for both players and so they need to go back home and take a break. And some people like analyzing these types of positions but back then there weren't as strong as computers as we have now and usually the human brain was still the better calculator. So after this, time on played rook d6 and after this white played king e2 king d8, rook d3. And now here Fisher is forcing the rook exchange. And this might seem counterintuitive at first because now it seems as though black has regained full advantage because now all of these pawns are symmetrical. And now black has the knight for the bishop. However, here Fisher is able to swindle a win out and it starts off as king d3. Knight e7, bishop e8, attacking the g6 pawn, king d5, bishop f7, king d6, king c4, king c6, bishop e8, king b7, king b5. So as you can see, Fisher is making slight progress every second. And after knight c8, threatening knight d6, here black played, white played bishop c6 check. Now, most of you might be thinking, hey, why can't you take the pawn on g6? Isn't it for free? So, after bishop takes g6, it's a huge blunder. He has knight d6, wasn't just a fork of the bishop, it's actually just the maiden one. So, Fisher had to be extremely careful, but luckily, Fisher has bishop c6 check, which allows the bishop to d5, and now the king's gonna come to a6, which is an extremely safe square. After knight d7, now Fisher is able to bring his bishop back, and after king b7, bishop b3, now black has to let white in somehow. So this is a motif known as zugzwang, which is an extremely important motif that we can learn. It means that your opponent's pieces are on their best placed positions, but now your opponent has to make a move and worsen his position unwillingly. Here, if black moves his knight somewhere, then black, white will be able to play bishop d5 check and brings king to a6. Or if black moves his king, for example after king a7, white is able to bring his bishop to a better diagonal. Like this. And now here, if black if still play king a7, then now white can play something like bishop h1, and now another zigzag. now the king has to protect, so the king cannot move, and the knight is in his best position, but now the knight has to move, after knight g8, now white is able to bring his king to c6, and white will be winning easily. So because of this line, after bishop d1, king b7, bishop f3, here Taimana decides to play king c7, and allow the king back into a6. And here Taimana plays knight c8, and now Fisher continues to swindle out the win. And after knight d6, something like this would be extremely good, as after bishop g8, now the position collapses. However, Taimana plays a slightly weaker move, which is knight g8. 
and after bishop d5, we transpose back practically. And now bishop f7, knight e7, and bishop e8. This is an extremely deadly zigzag because now the king is stuck here, and now the knight has to protect the pawn. The king has to protect this pawn. So after black white king d8, what did Fisher decide to do here? This is the final stride of the game. Okay, if you realize that Fisher should sacrifice his bishop now, you were correct. Bishop takes g6 is completely winning now. And after knight takes g6, as you can see, these pawns restrict the knight perfectly. So white has no worries now. Now black white takes on b6. And here, it's extremely hard to even try to defend. And now after king d7, white is able to play king takes c5, knight e7, and now white starts breaking through. And now white has these two connected pass pawns. After knight c8, a5, as you can see, white has three pawns for the knight now with a much more active king. After knight d6, b5, knight e4 check, king b6, and now here the final blunder, king c8, and after king c6, king b8, b6, and this position Taimanov decided to resign because there was nothing that black can do. If black plays something like knight takes g7, a6, knight e4, a7, king a8, b7, king takes a8, king c7, b8 queen comes, and now white wins. Instead of playing king c8, knight d6 might have been a better move, but after a6, knight c8, king c7, king, king c5, king c7, king d5, and now, as you can see, the white king is headed to the other, oh, my bad, the white is, white is headed to the other side, and now after king g5, king b6, king h5, king c5, the, the black king is just way too far away. And now something like f6, king e6, king g6, g5, h5, and now all these pawns are advancing to victory. And here white is easily winning. So an extremely beautiful endgame performance by Fisher. Fisher starts off maneuvering his rook and forcing black's pawns onto undesirable squares. f5, g6, and h7. Undesirable squares. And now Fisher realizes this, and now Fisher decides to force a trade of rooks. Now after king c7, Fisher decides to trade off the rooks, and now uses bishop to dominate his opponent's knight. Now the knight is stuck. And this means that Fisher can continue to bring his king up the board through these holes. Now once the king is able to reach the back side of black's position, black will start dropping pawns. After king c6, bishop b8, the king comes to b5, and now Fisher plays an extremely good zigzag attack. After bishop d5, this forces black to play knight e7. After bishop f7, this forces black to play king b7. Bishop b3 forces black to make a zigzag decision, which was king a7, but now bishop d1, king b7, bishop f3 is the final zigzag because now after king a7, bishop h1 is a deadly zigzag. So as you can see, Fischer follows Zugzwang after Zugzwang, and here, black is completely stuck. However, after bishop d1, king b7, bishop f3, Taimanov tries a better defense, and now Taimanov plays knight g8, and now Fischer delays, and finally is able to find a break move of bishop takes g6, sacrificing his bishop, and taking all of black's pawns, breaking through, and now Fischer marches to victory. So that is something we can all learn from the beautiful endgame expert Robert James Fisher. And also back in the opening, Fisher doesn't decide to take the advantage and goes for something that is more well known. He plays a solid opening and he's able to develop his pieces without any problems. If you think that this position also looks good, maybe you can also start analyzing this fianchetta line against the Taimanov. And here, Fisher finds this beautiful move, bishop f4, which allows Fisher's position to continue to develop. After this position develops, black continues playing solidly, but now it's almost impossible to play solid after black white plays rook d1, forces blocking to play e5, and now here, bishop g4, bishop takes, pawn takes, f3, and f4, the breakthrough move, able to 
start attacking the e5 pawn. Here, after rook b8, knight d5, bishop takes, pawn takes, e4, rook e1, rook takes d5, and now white starts breaking through completely. He trades off, he brings all his pieces back, and he's able to get an extremely solid position. And now we reach the end game where white uses his kingside pawns and starts dominating the position. After pushing Black's pawns up one by one, Fisher finally decides to trade the rooks, and then Fisher plays an absolute masterpiece with his dominating bishop against Black's horrible knight. So an extremely beautiful performance by Fisher, and something that we can learn from. So I hope you learned something from this game, and I'll see you in the next video. Have a great day!